departure from First Church in 1897. Charles Cuthbert Hall preached a sermon to the children in his congregation. We are here together in the building which we have learned to call our church. This roof, these walls, these windows, the great organ. It is a dear, happy place with a happiness that seems to make us better. Paul helped his young audience to understand that this church was a sanctuary and a place of refuge. Think of icy steamers out at sea, plunging through fearful waves, trying to get to a sanctuary, a place of refuge from these roaring storms. He told the children that the church could not exist without them. You have something in yourselves which you can give by coming that adds to the strength and beauty of this church. The next pastor of First Church would come to challenge his Christian community in its education of children. He would also look back 100 years in his church's history and raise fundamental questions about the relationship between God and science. It was 1897 when L. Mason Clark accepted the call to First Presbyterian. He entered his community when Brooklyn and the rest of New York were racing toward the 20th century and what would later be called the Progressive Era, when the country would shake off the excesses of the Gilded Age and cast a critical eye on itself. Brooklyn had already established its success as a manufacturing and transportation center. Elevated trains and streetcars seemed to be everywhere, so much so that its population was mockingly called trolley dodgers. Something about the term must have appealed to Brooklynites, who later took the reference and turned it into a source of pride. The invention of the assembly line was preceded by time and motion studies, all to increase efficiency, a concept that extended from the shop floor into consumer households and even to the American pulpit. In the homiletic review, a kind of trade journal for ministers, advertisements catering to the needs of religious leaders promoted courses to improve pulpit English. Is your language as polished, refined, correct, and forceful as a preacher's really ought to be? And included endorsements. Your course has intensified my hatred for slang and my love for pure expression. I find my vocabulary is fuller. There were courses for ministers who worried that their Sunday school classes were too dull. There were books for clergy who wanted to modernize their religious library to keep pace with new ideas and to keep their congregations intact. Fishers of men, are there holes in your net? The new Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge saves time for the busy pastor. Long research is no longer necessary. When Clark arrived, he brought swift change to First Church. His sermons were considered succinct, even terse, when compared with Hall's empathic style. He outlined the challenges facing a modern minister. He must never forget that most people are busy. If the minister gets any chance at all with them, he will need to be quick about it. Under Clark's leadership, the treasury erased its debts, additional windows were installed, and rooms were added to the upper floor. The church also announced a newly formed men's association. At its first organizational meeting, 70 men arrived to share their talents and ideas. The result of their efforts came in the form of a new monthly magazine. In its opening declaration, the editors announced, we hope to be a medium between you and the facts. Our name then suggests our aim, the field and the work. This publication combined lay impressions from across the congregation. In prior ministries at First Presbyterian, the senior pastor spoke to the people. Now the people joined with him and spoke with one another in a variety of voices but those voices were almost always male. The men listed their official duties on the inside cover. The women's positions were found in the back. 
They included the Missionary Society, the Ladies Association, and the Girls Guild. There were enthusiastic reports on such topics as... Christian missions overseas. Amateur dramatics. A hiking expedition of the Excelsior Manly Boys Club. An article by a member of the congregation serving as a Red Cross nurse in wartime Europe. And developments within the church's mission branch in the poorer part of Brooklyn. The first edition came out in May 1914, and religious education was its theme. Both First Church and its mission branch instituted a rigorous curriculum for the children, while also advocating for more religious instruction in the home. A special column in the fields and the work listed young people who are off to school and college, including Yale, Smith, Vassar, and Harvard. At the city mission branch kindergarten, instructors taught their students to say, please excuse me and pardon me, and students learned about the trades, such as baker, blacksmith, and carpenter. As First Presbyterian and its mission branch tried to school its children, factory owners pulled their vast labor force from countryside and cities. They were supplemented by new immigrants who were streaming in from Ellis Island, eager for work. They also found an ideal population to feed the growing machinery of capitalism. Children. In 1870, one out of every eight children was employed. By 1900, the ratio rose to one in five. Children provided an ideal combination of factors in the capitalist pursuit of unskilled labor in such places as factories, cotton mills, coal mines, and agriculture. They could be paid tiny salaries. Their small bodies could fit into confined spaces in often unsafe conditions. They had no power to go out on strike. There was no one to successfully speak for this population until the photographer, Louis Hine, took up the study of child labor and provided a series of photographs that documented these children, dwarfed by the brutal machinery of industry. The silence of those who had no voice was suddenly broken. But the attention of Americans was pulled into other directions, particularly when the Progressive Era ended. A world war claimed 20 million people and reached into the lives of those at First Church. A flu pandemic killed 675,000 Americans and forced people to wear masks in indoor spaces, including public transportation. The passing of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, was a hallmark of the post-war era. Despite this, full participation by women in the work of First Church would not come until far into the future. The abiding sins of racism would continue and feed the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1921, a murderous rampage by a white mob in Tulsa, Oklahoma, caused the deaths of multiple African-American citizens and the destruction of a prosperous black community. In 1922, First Church observed its centennial celebration. Clark reviewed its history in his sermon, A Century of Revelation. He took to task the static beliefs held by his church's founding fathers. One of my predecessors declared, the gospel of Christ is never to be altered or modified. The Bible is the only inspired classic in the world, and nothing is true that contradicts it. The Bible is not a book of magic or superstition, but a straightforward record of the eternal in the spirit of man. And then, standing in direct contradiction to the Bible, he offered the science of evolution as the organizing principle of which the whole of life is to be interpreted and illuminated. Proponents of the Bible's infallibility argued their position at the 1923 National Gathering of the Presbyterian General Assembly. They won a majority vote and required that a Presbyterian minister believe in five principles of faith. From the pulpit, Clark listed them. The inerrancy of scripture, the virgin birth of Jesus, a particular theory of the death of Christ on the cross, 
The physical resurrection of our Lord and the veracity and genuineness of the miracles attributed to Jesus. Then, according to one newspaper report, Clark stopped to wipe his glasses and said, In all frankness, I do not believe one of those five points. He denounced the assertion that men and women who think according to the scientific method and who cultivate an open mind are not wanted. It strikes another blow in the process of alienating from the church the intelligent and educated modern spirit of our youth. The General Assembly undertook to say that certain things must not be tolerated in the preaching from the pulpits of the denomination. Those in his congregation who disagreed with Clark's beliefs still praised his courage in asserting the rights of religious liberty. The science of evolution would be given its ultimate test in 1925, when a Tennessee high school teacher would challenge the state's anti-evolution law and would eventually succeed. America's industrial engines would continue to churn. For the next hundred years, it would look to the future, even as it overlooked its underrepresented. In the evolving world, the abuses of child labor would not find redress until Congress enacted the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. And America would struggle with its conscience for generations to come over the education and well-being of our nation's most precious resource. Clark retired in 1924, having served as pastor for 27 years. He remained steadfast in his beliefs against the ultra-Orthodox in his Presbyterian faith, devoting himself to work, blessed by the Spirit of God who has always been leading men into clearer truth. Mm -hmm.